You don't want us deciding what morality should look like in your communities because no one elected us. Nobody heard what we had to say about how we should come out on abortion or guns or school choice and decided, yep, that's the guy I want deciding my rights, my obligations, and my morality. So what we're going to do is a little bit of compare and contrast between the Dentora system and the secular legal system, uh, which is a very interesting interplay. But I, I think the best way to, to begin this is to give you a general overview and help to dispel uh, a lot of confusion that even some lawyers have about varieties of, of system and procedure. Uh, I have uh, Rabbi uh, Beryl uh, um, Bell, who is a member of the Montreal Besden. Uh, we have also, Judge Roy Altman, uh, who is, um, when, it, when appointed, was the youngest member of the U.S. District Court in Florida, um, I think at age 36. I'm going to ask both of you, but we'll start with Rabbi Bill. Could you give us a little bit of insight into what is a Din Torah? Okay, so uh, there are, uh, were a lot of questions that you just asked. So let's uh, start with the basics. Let's all in one minute. Maybe I should just start, many, many people might not be familiar with how the, the system of rabbinic court works and where it came from. Just historically, um, you read about the Sanhedrin, the great Jewish court with great rabbis through the ages. There was a process called smicha, which the ordination, which is the true rabbinic ordination, has not been in existence for over a thousand years. In order to be an ordained rabbi, really, really, means that you had to be ordained by somebody who was ordained by Moses. Okay, Moses ordained Yeshua, he gave smicha to him, and that went on through all the ages. When you see in the Talmud, somebody is called Rabbi Yehuda, and somebody is called Rav Yehuda, the Yud, Rabbi Yehuda, means that he was ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody who was ordained by Moses. That ceased a long time ago, and therefore many laws of the Torah, such as the simplest one is capital punishment, is impossible for any uh, Jewish judge or rabbi, uh, regardless of his level, to adjudicate today. We do not have, the Torah does not give us that authority. However, uh, we are, we do have the authority to judge most financial cases when we're given the freedom to do so in general throughout Jewish history. There were rare exceptions um, when the Rabbeinu Asher, the Rosh, came to Spain. He was surprised. He came from Germany where he's running away from persecution. And then in Spain, the government gave the Jewish community the responsibility of adjudicating criminal law within the Jewish community. But that's an exception. Normally, we're only allowed to do financial law. And in the present situation, we do not have that autonomy either, really. And there's a different system in Israel. But uh, we operate under the arbitration law. So, so in most um, jurisdictions, the secular uh, court, secular justice system allows binding arbitration. So our rabbinic court becomes uh, the arbitration board. So when somebody um, comes to rabbinic court, they have to sign a paper agreeing to abide by the decision of the rabbinic court in accordance with the laws of the Torah, and in our case, I um, live in Montreal, the arbitration law of the province of Quebec. So we have to make sure that our um, procedures adhere to those uh, civil procedures as well for arbitration. And therefore, today, we work together with the secular system. So a decision that we issue is enforceable by the secular courts. and. We call it homologating. I don't know whether it's used in other, so it's always the same. Canada, too. Oh, it's all of Canada, I guess, OK? We homologate, and then it's enforceable by the uh, secular court. And uh, somebody wants to appeal that, they can do that. And it's happened before. I had to give a, you know, a, a testimony or something regarding a decision that we made. But I could tell you, even though the Quebec, Quebecois judges, uh, in general, the Quebecois society might not be famous throughout the world for their uh, tolerance of other religions, um, but they've always treated all of our judges with the utmost respect. There was a case where two people came, two religious Jews came, 
and it came in front of the judge, and the Quebecois judge says, what are you doing here? Why are you not going to rabbinic arbitration? <laughs> judge Altman, could you tell us a little bit about secular courts? Sure. So uh, in the United States, uh, you've probably seen the map in school. There are 50 states. That's not uh, a surprise to you. That's not the map that uh, I operate in, and, and it's strange to think of it that way. There are actually... The United States is broken up into two different systems, a state system, 50 states, we're in the state of Florida, and then a federal system, and there are 94 federal districts in the United States. Now, there are thousands of state judges in every state, but there are only 500 of us federal judges in the country under the, where uh, our positions are created in the Constitution and the original um, Judiciary Act of 1789, when the country was founded, uh, our positions were created, and there, um, th there are very strict requirements as to how you become a federal judge. You have to be nominated by the President of the United States, and then you have to receive a confirmatory vote by the United States Senate. Um, and, and every federal judge in American history, including all the Supreme Court justices who are federal judges on the Supreme Court, have gone through the same system. Um, so uh, what do we do in federal court? In federal court, um, we do what we say, we have three sides of the job. One side is the criminal law, federal criminal cases. What does that mean? Federal corruption cases, international drug trafficking, all terrorist cases, big financial frauds, anything that involves international relations or interstate relations, any crime that crosses borders is a federal crime. And so that's one part of it. The other parts of it is there are two sides of civil law. One side of civil law is all kinds of cases that uh, in the old English courts we would say were in equity. In England, uh, for a thousand years, there were two kinds of judges, equity courts, law courts. All you need to know about that is that equity courts did not have juries and they got to tell you what to do. So for example, your neighbor is impinging on your land, an equity judge in England could say, okay, build your fence you know, somewhere else, and there's no jury for that. It was judge-made law. The courts of law were courts that gave money damages. I ran you over with my carriage. You deserve 15 pounds, and so I award you 15 pounds. Those always in English history uh, involve juries. In America, they've combined the equity courts. We've combined the equity courts and the law courts in one person. That's me. And so federal judges sit in both equity and at law. That's why if you bring an equitable claim, say for example, I am the judge in the case where a, a boy transitions to a girl, wants to play on the girl's soccer team in, in high school. Um, Florida, as you may know, has passed a law saying that that person cannot play on the girl's soccer team. Uh, the family has sued under the US Constitution. It comes to me, I'm the judge that has to resolve that question. That is a question of equity, right? In that case, I'm gonna either determine that she, I'm gonna force the school to let uh, the child play on the girls' soccer team, or I'm gonna prevent the, the child from playing on the, girl, on the girls' soccer team. Um, so now, if uh, the, the family were to win and is seeking money damages, then of course that part of it would be at law. And when I resolve that constitutional question, there would be a jury that would decide how much money is at stake. So um, that's a, a, a sort of simplistic way of viewing it, but just for purposes of today, you should know that on the civil side, my jurisdiction runs the gamut. From antitrust cases, we do all the patent litigation, um, which is both in equity and at law, so there's a part that I decide, a part a jury decides, and of course, all constitutional issues, abortion rights, race rights, gun rights, school choice rights, you name, you've seen it on the news, that's what we handle um, on a daily and weekly basis. And, um, and, and so the question then becomes, what's the difference between us as federal judges and uh, state judges? State judges handle local matters. We handle matters that are either national or international or involve, as I said, um, the US Constitution. Thank you. I have a question for both of you, which you've both partially answered already, but I'm gonna put it in a different context. How does the Dentora system operate within the secular system uh, in terms of certification, enforceability, appeal, anything else that, that is relevant? I'm going to defer. 
Basically, it depends on the arbitration law in every jurisdiction. So uh, we have to, um, when you have a, many years ago you had um, sort of complete Jewish communities that handled everything from taxation. There was a government for the, for the system that collected their own taxes, <laughs> had own representatives, and, the, and the, the secular government would interact with those representatives, and you had many different models of this throughout uh, Jewish history. But that really does not exist today. So um, many of the measures, let's say for enforcing a judgment, we do not have the power to do that. We don't have a police force. We don't have bailiffs. So that's why we work so closely in uh, conjunction with the secular system, and the arbitration law is a recognizable form of uh, resolution for dispute. Um, on the other hand, we don't compel anyone to come to us. So according to Jewish law, when two Jewish people um, have a dispute, if it's a financial dispute, they're required under Jewish law to come to rabbinic court. Um, they're not allowed to go to secular court because they're supposed to be judged according to the laws of the Torah. Um, if one of the sides doesn't want to come, so we can't compel them to come, and then the Bezdin gives a letter giving them permission to go to secular court. So they come to us in the, in the Jewish system. Now, obviously, many people don't do that, but those that are aware from an uh, observant background and observant of Torah law first come to the rabbinic court, and then um, we'll go to the secular court. And there are many cases that we have to work very, very closely together. Um, and there's really a lot of uh, cooperation in family law, divorce law, um, different sorts of uh, regulatory issues. We once had a sticky case where it was really, if somebody's operating under a secular system, we have, for example, in Quebec, there's a landlord-tenant law that even if you don't sign a lease, you're automatically, you give your first check, you give your first rent check, it's like signing the contract of the landlord-tenant law. So you're bound by that. So what happens when you have a dispute about something that's not written in the landlord-tenant law? So then we have to look for the case law and clarify it with those magistrates over there that are dealing with that system. We want to say it wasn't landlord-tenant, it was another uh, regulatory uh, case, and it wasn't written, and it was a real, we were puzzled, and uh, we contacted them to say, how do you usually... Um, deal with such a case, and they came back to us and, and they said, we want the rabbinic court to decide. Well, um, all of the kinds of cases that he described are cases, obviously, that don't come before me. We don't deal with family law. We don't deal with landlord-tenant law. Um, but, but what I was going to say is that we have a very strong presumption in the United States after 1925, Congress passed and the president signed the FA, the Federal Arbitration Act. And long story short, the reason that the act was passed is because federal judges took their cue from old English judges who didn't want to relinquish jurisdiction over cases, even where the individual parties had consented in a pre-litigation agreement to go to arbitration. What do I mean by that? I recognize you're not all lawyers. If you have a dispute in America, you can and it's, and it's a federal case, a constitutional case, or a huge financial case involving businesses and, and the like, you can come to me, to federal court. But what happens is, let's imagine, for example, that you go buy a cell phone at AT&T, right? Many of you have, or, or Apple. And, um, and you buy your cell phone, and they make you click through the agreement, right? And there are like 20 pages that, has anybody ever read any of that? No, nobody ever reads it. I don't read it either, okay? But I can assure you that every single one of these agreements, and it's not just cell phone, it's just about everything you've, you buy on a daily basis in America on page 16, line 743, has an arbitration clause that basically says, if you have any dispute whatsoever with me, Apple, AT&T, Comcast, insert business here, then you agree that you won't go see Judge Altman in federal court, that you won't be allowed to bring a concerted class action. What do I mean by that? What happens is, Let's say AT&T has an advertisement. This is a famous case that went to the Supreme Court. If AT&T has an advertisement, they say, come to our store and you will get a free cell phone. So of course, everybody says, I want a free cell phone. And so we all go to the store, we all get our free cell phone and they go to check you out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Altman. 
Here's your free cell phone. That'll be $21.19. What do you mean $21.19? It was a free cell phone. Yes, it's free, but we still have to charge you the taxes and the whatever operational fee, which is $14. Well, no, you promised a free cell phone. So what happens? An individual person is never going to find a lawyer to sue in federal court over $21.19 because the lawyer wants to take a third and no lawyer is going to work for $7. But if you can aggregate the claims of 100 million Americans who suffered the exact same loss, then you can get the most powerful law firms in America to come before Judge Altman in federal court and litigate on behalf of 21 times 100 million, a big number. And so that is what the defense industry, these big companies who hire the big law firms in New York, have tried to fight since 1925 by including these arbitration clauses under the Federal Arbitration Act that was passed in 1925 uh, to get these things out from federal court and put them in arbitration panels where, for example, Mr. Altman will not be allowed to aggregate his claims with 99 million other Americans. He's going to have to bring his own claim and pay his own fee. And of course, no one will represent him. He probably won't do it. The upshot of that for purposes of rabbinic court is that if two parties were going to agree in advance of whatever litigation occurred to arbitrate their dispute, two Jewish uh, businesses enter into an agreement, and that agreement stipulates that any dispute between them will be resolved in arbitration by a rabbinic court here in Florida or New York or Canada or wherever it might be. And then, of course, years later, they get into a big dispute. It's millions of dollars. And the one side realizes, you know what, I don't want to be in rabbinic court. I want Judge Altman to resolve my case. And they file a lawsuit in federal court in front of me. I'm going to look at that arbitration agreement, and I'm going to send it to rabbinic court because under the act from 1925, that is what I'm going to be required to do. Now, of course, there are a million different arguments that you can make about the fairness or unfairness of being ousted from your constitutional right to be in front of me, and I'm probably going to consider them and ultimately reject them and send you to Rabbi Bell. That was a very, very interesting uh, uh, case, and t I just wanted to add something in terms of the experience of the people that are involved in disputes. Because when you go to court, so that's sort of like the highest level of intervention. Secular court, rabbinic court, even though legally um, it's arbitration under the secular, in the eyes of the secular system, but in our system and from our perspective, it's court. You're going to the Bet Din, you're going to the rabbinic court. We put it under the Arbitration Act for enforceability. That's our interest over here. However, before that, you know, we have mediation. You have other levels, and just on a, on a experiential, I don't really have any data, but very often parties will come to the to a rabbinic court and will recommend, you know, maybe try to settle out of court beforehand. We might recommend someone that has experience, and um, there are some communities. One community that I was once on the rabbinic court, associated with the rabbinic court, um, had. Uh, uh, institution called Mishpat Sholom, which was business people who were respected in their relative uh, businesses, and we would send them to them. And it was a very interesting thing. My personal experience, almost always the people that came out of Mishpat Sholom, when they sat down with bu business people who were in a dispute, and they had expressed their concerns and their claims before other business people, they came out happier, the loser, was in, in, in that Mishpat HaSholem was uh, at a similar level of uh, satisfaction than the winner in rabbinic court. Hmm. Because even when somebody wins, there's usually some, nobody wins 100%. There's usually some sort of compromise. Nobody's 100% right when it comes to these cases. And although we do understand, but they feel that they don't understand, and they can say things in front of their fellow businessmen that they're not going to say in front of the judges, so they feel that they were well understood, and somehow it seems that there's more satisfaction. So in spite of the fact you have uh, the rabbinic uh, court and the secular court, federal court represented here, it's better to stay out of court. That's true. I, I, I keep the, the microphone for a second. Uh, does that mean that the court itself does not um, engage in mediation? and does not 
uh, make a proposal for, for, uh, for compromise? Okay, um, so I have to back up in, in uh, conjunction with what I said previously about our authority. Um, in general, our, our agreement um, has in it a clause that they have to sign. And if, no, if they don't want to sign, we don't hear the case because you know, what's, the loser is going to just take it to the civil court. So we're not going to waste our time if it's not going to be, they're not going to be serious about it. We also write into the agreement that we're not bound to do precisely as it says in the Code of Jewish Law. Although our system is based on the Code of Jewish Law, uh, but nevertheless, in order to leave room for compromise or to settle a case, even though the letter of the law might indicate differently, we are bound by the letter of the law. If the Code of Jewish Law says like this, then it's like that. However, um, we write into it that we have, we, um, if you're trusting us, you'll trust us that we're going to come up with what we might consider to be an equitable compromise or something of that nature. That gives the judges the legal space in order to go outside the, what's written in order to what we consider to be a, a just and more permanent well, let me resolution. Talk about that because that's, I think that's the, the biggest difference between these two systems. It, that is not my role at all. And, and you probably, whatever newspaper you read, um, you probably get angry, uh, depending on which side of the political aisle you are on, about the decisions of federal judges across the country. And you probably are not a sentient being if you don't feel angry one way or the other. Um, let me tell you that, that in general, you should not feel angry. Because when I swore an oath, and I did swear on a chumash at my investiture. When I swore an oath, I did not swear an oath to do justice. I did not swear an oath to come out with the fair result. I did not swear an oath to do the right thing. And if you don't understand the oath that was sworn, and you think that my job is like his job, what he just said, which is to have wiggle room to come out where the judges think the right answer is, then you're gonna be disappointed every time. You should understand what our role is. The idea in 1776 was that we had come from a system where all power, legislative, passed the law, executive, enforce the law, judicial, adjudicate or resolve disputes about the law, were in one person or one branch of government. And we felt that that person, George III, had become a tyrant and he had abused that power. And we wanted to create a different kind of system, which we called representative democracy. And in that system, we gave all of the legislative power to the Congress. And we gave all of the executive power to the president. And we gave all of the judicial power, the power to resolve disputes between the other two branches and between citizens and their government to the judiciary. But the point of that is that we did not give the judiciary the right to say what the law should be. We gave the judiciary only the power to say what the law is. And if you think about it, if we were to do otherwise, we, unelected federal judges, who are not representative of you at all, let's be real, there's only 500 of us, there's 330 million Americans. The vast majority of us went to very fancy schools and frankly come from money and are mostly white and mostly male. We do not represent all of America. That's just the way it is. Now it's changing, but it's historically always been true. You don't want us deciding what morality should look like in your communities because no one elected us. Nobody heard what we had to say about how we should come out on abortion or guns or school choice and decided, yep, that's the guy I want deciding my rights, my obligations, and my morality. And so if we really mean what we say when we claim to be a democracy, we should insist that the democratic branches of government, Congress and the presidency, do their job to pass laws that as best as possible reflect your moral views. And then we should leave it to the courts only to interpret what they have passed and say it's either X or it's Y. And so what I wanna leave you with here today is what I tell all of my law clerks when they start, which is 
you know you're doing your job as a federal judge when you write opinions that directly contradict your own worldview. And it happens all the time. It's the hardest but most rewarding part of my job. I am constantly ruling in ways that if it were me, Roy Altman, the citizen, I would disagree with and I would go the other way. But I can't because it's not what Congress said the law was and it's my job just to read the law, read the dispute, and interpret what the Constitution says and what the law is, and not to make up what I think is the fair or just result. And so if you want an opportunity to have a group of judges that you trust come out with what you think is the fair, just result, don't come to federal court. It's going to be too expensive anyway. Go to rabbinic court or another arbitration panel where they have that flexibility that, frankly, I don't have. I, I do have a follow-up question. Based I, I, on I have that. to follow up. That was great, but now we're we're really getting to the point. Okay, we're 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 we're, we're digging in a little bit. I have the reason the reason for this. So let's say the judge is required to tell you what the law is, not what his personal opinion is. That's the way the system works. Let's say you don't like the law, so you have recourse. You have recourse in the, in, the, in the civil system because in the civil system, in the federal system, the state system, it's all the same in secular law. Um, who makes the law? Wh who appoints the judge? You don't like the law, so change the law. You can change the law. Elect different officials. You have the right in a democratic system to change the law. Not only that, you have the right in a democratic system, whether you have the right or not is um, perhaps debatable, but you could always change the system. Just like it was changed from a monarchy, a monarchy to a democracy, it could be changed from a democracy to something else if the people want. That's what they did not all over. Sometimes it required making people a little bit shorter, like the height of a head, as they did in France, um, but they changed the system. You can, the, the ultimate, I think the legal term is Grundsnorm. What is the fundamental principle in secular law is that the power is in the hands of the people. And the people make the system. The people decide to make a monarchy. Well, the people, they didn't make the monarchy. But if they decide to do away with the monarchy, they'll do away with the monarchy. Then they could also do away with the democracy. And they could do away with any system they want. Um, in, in our system, we can't change the law. In our system, and the people in general that come to our system are people that believe that the Torah was given by God. And we don't have the power to change that. And for that reason, that is our underlying um, unshakable principle on which everything else is built. And the people that do not um, believe in that principle or wish to um, operate their lives according to that principle don't go to rabbinic court. So although Judge Olton was saying go to rabbinic court, what he, I think you meant was go to arbitration. Right. <laughs> no, that, that's what I meant. I meant uh, yeah, go you, to rabbinic court, right. go to arbitration. Okay. Now the reason why we take for ourselves that leeway, okay, because since we're dealing with cases, we do not have, when witnesses would come before the Sanhedrin, they were afraid what was going to happen. They were living within a system where there were very, very real life consequences. What would happen to them if they say something not true to the Sanhedrin? What's going to happen to the witnesses? If a witness gives false testimony, the whole beginning of the Masech Damakis, one of the tractates in the Talmud, speaks about what happens if somebody was Adam Zaymamin, it's a certain type of witness. If they give false testimony in a murder trial and you can prove that they gave false testimony, you execute the witnesses. Okay, so it's a whole different, it's a whole different cup of tea here. So when we are dealing with a case and we are bound to, to, the, to the laws of the Torah, to the letter, which we're prepared to do that, but we're living in a world that's not prepared to do that. And we don't have the power to enforce what it says there. So for us to take part of that system and be insistent on enforcing it to the letter of the law, and not keeping in mind the general picture in which people are living their lives and the real life implications of that. So therefore we say, you have to give us room that if we feel 
that given the circumstances, you're going to keep the letter of the law and it's going to be an improper conclusion, you have to give us, we who understand the law better than you do, okay, say that in order for the law to be carried out, in this case, you have to give us some room for um, extrajudicial um, uh, resolution. Let, let I just me just say one, one thing. There are two places where a federal judge can um, go beyond the bounds and do impose to some degree what the judge thinks is fair. And we talked about one of those already. When I sit in equity, where do I sit in equity? For example, in admiralty cases. I have admiralty uh, docket. There's uh, things that happen in the ocean. Those are federal jurisdiction. When I sit in admiralty, let's imagine that the owner of a Russian vessel, right? This is a, a case that I had. Let's say that the owner of a Russian vessel, he disappears. Now with the war in Ukraine, the vessel gets confiscated. It's got a ton of art, very expensive art. And the vessel is the size of this room, okay? It's a $100 million vessel. But there are lots of people that need to be paid from that vessel. There's the crew who hasn't been paid. There's the... There's the boat yard that hasn't been paid. There are the repair people who haven't been paid. Lots of people who have claims. So what do I do with that vessel? I have no one who is here to claim the vessel. I have the vessel that's been confiscated. I've got all these people who need to be paid. So I can do the fair thing. I can, set, I can put the vessel through the U.S. Marshals who are charged not just with our security but also with running our auctions. And I can put the vessel up for sale along with, by the way, all of its artwork and anything else that's what we call an appurtenance to the vessel that comes with the vessel. And then when I get all of the money from that, I can divide that up amongst the people that are owed money in what I think is an equitable or fair way because, again, I'm sitting in equity. That's what that means. And that's, that's because we derive our equitable powers from old English law. The other example, which you've probably already guessed, is criminal sentencing. At criminal sentencing, a federal judge sits in judgment over a human being and imposes a sentence, often in federal court, of very long prison terms. Um, and it's important to me to look at the entire body of that person's life, the things they've done well, the things they've done badly, and based on a huge aggregation of factors to come up with what I think is the fair and reasonable sentence for that person. So there are two instances, I would say, when, when fairness, I think, does, does break into the analysis as well. One further extension of the discussion right now. Uh, I read in, in a very recent par Parsha, it was either last week or the week before. Here's a direct quote from the Parsha. As your judges, they will be responsible for inculcating in you, that is, the Jewish people, <coughs> with moral integrity and will therefore bear responsibility for your sins. I think this is an, uh, preliminarily for, for Rabbi Bell to, to comment on. Is that a correct statement? And is that in, in the minds of, of rabbinical judges when they make a decision? You're quoting a verse from the five books of Moses and you're asking me if it's an accurate statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, to what extent do you embrace it in, in, in practice? He failed his judge's exam. <laughs> Um, let me first explain how one becomes a judge because this is another dis difference in the system the way the secular system is set up at least in the federal level is that you appoint the executive branch appoints uh, the judicial branch the members of the judicial branch um, in that same section over there that you were quoting so it says you should take the judges from among your tribes because you know the people that are fit and not fit among the 12 tribes. So each of the 12 tribes are Jewish people. So they had their own, their own court with their own judges. So who appointed them? So the people appointed them. And in our case, um, so um, some places you have elections for the rabbi of a community. But a judge on the Bed Din, since we don't normally compel people, people are coming by choice, 
And there are a number of, especially in a place like New York, for example, there are many, many rabbinic courts. So what happens if a person receives a subpoena from one rabbinic court? So the defendant has the right, according to Jewish law, to determine the venue and to say, I prefer another rabbinic court. That goes after the, um, after the defendant. Let's say they can't really come to agreement. So then there's a system called as it's known. Each side picks one judge and the two judges pick a third and they make up their own beddin. They make up their own rabbinic uh, court. And that's a very lengthy discussion about the relative advantages and disadvantages of that system. That's not what the session is about but I think it's a very, uh, very interesting topic. But since we don't compel people to come, so then the people, so our Besden, for example, is representative of the whole city. So the way it's composed is that each major community in the city um, has one member representing them on the rabbinic court. So the Rabbi Handel, who was the, the, when he passed away, he was the Rabbi Lubavitch community. So Lubavitch has a member, and Skabar has a member, and Bells has an Asfardim, and the, so we have all the different compositions. So if somebody doesn't feel comfortable, then they, they won't come. So they are, um, uh, for lack of a better word, buying into this system. So they trust us to give the guidance that they're looking for. So that's a responsibility that we have, and, and we take it to the best of, uh, best of our ability. So b before going to questions, I have one final question for you. Uh, if I have a dispute, a commercial dispute, landlord, tenant, uh, a contract, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of going to secular court or going to rabbinical court? Uh, some of the... the the qualities that, that come to my mind are procedural fairness, the result, the, the, the decision, the cost of, of engaging in these proceedings, the time required to do it, and the enforceability of the decision, and anything else that you think is relevant. So basically, I'm asking you to, to make a pitch for your own system. <laughs> I don't know that I would. I'd probably dissuade you from coming to me. <laughs> Uh, he, here, here's what you should expect if you come to me. Um, I have, in the way, that, you know, we, we have a, an unbelievable wealth of, of resources. Every federal judge, like me, has three or four magistrate judges. I have a magistrate judge in Key West. We're a huge district, so I have a magistrate judge for Miami-Dade. I have a magistrate judge for Broward cases. I have a magistrate judge for West Palm, Palm Beach County cases. And I have a magistrate judge for Fort Pierce, all the way up in the northern part, almost all the way to Orlando. And uh, the magistrate judges have their own law clerks and their own staff and their own courtroom and their own chambers, and they handle a lot of the preliminary matters before you can get to me. Discovery, documents, when you get like a hearing, when you, what you can say at depositions, what kinds of questions can be asked, et cetera. Then if, when you come to me, um, you get a federal judge who has four law clerks um, from the best law schools in America, the brightest, the best young lawyers in the country, uh, in my opinion, um, who are going to read every single word of everything that you have submitted, and they're going to treat your case like it's their mother's case, the most important thing that ever happened, because it's very, you got to jump through a million hoops to get to me, but once you get there, you get our full attention. The reason I said you might want to be dissuaded is you might not want my full attention. You may have a meritless argument. You may have a frivolous position, in which case you're going to bear the brunt of that reality. But what I can tell you is that you're going to come to me. You're going to get uh, a ton of attention. If you show up for a hearing, and, and you probably will have a hearing in front of me, you're going to get a million questions from me that I have gone over with my law clerks um, uh, for days. Uh, intellectual questions, hypothetical questions, what are the bounds of the principle that you're asking me to impose, right? If I rule for you, how far do I go? What's the implications of that for a thousand cases down the road? And lots of other hypotheticals about your position, and I'm going to do the same to the other side. And so the benefits, I think, and, and of course, I'm sure you get the same treatment in the rabbinic court, so it's not like 
it's better or worse. It's just the reality. When you come to me, you're going to get a lot of attention uh, uh, to your case, paid to your case by my magistrate judges and their staff, by me and my staff, um, and you're going to get the full court press. Like I said, that could be good, that could be bad. Of course, that means it's very expensive. And that's reason number one through 100 why you don't want to come to me. It's going to cost millions of dollars to litigate a huge commercial case in front of me. You're going to have to hire federal court lawyers. You're going to have to go to lots of depositions and hire experts and uh, present a case that is beautiful and prepared for a federal judge to review. Um, it is a lot less expensive uh, to go to an arbitration panel. Um, in terms of the speed and, and in that respect, um, in federal court, we resolve cases very, very quickly. Um, but I think there are arbitration panels where you can get uh, a resolution probably even faster than you would in federal court. And the last part of it is, I think, what you were talking about, which is, and what we've been talking about, what kind of procedural guarantee do you want? If you want someone who's going to apply the rigor of every law, you, you want to be in federal court. We have the rules of evidence. We have the rules of civil and criminal procedure. We have all of these other constitutional constraints that uh, I've talked to you about. So you know what the game is going in. I mean, you may not know as the litigant, but your lawyers certainly do. They know that it's a basketball game and there are 48 minutes and there are four quarters and this is how long the court is and how wide. They know all the, the ins and outs of the procedural fairness of the thing. How it comes out, of course, is anybody's best guess. In arbitration, it's not so clear cut. Depending on the arbitration venue, there may be no rules of evidence. You may be allowed to bring in, well, you know, Hannah's cousin Moisha said that, you know, that kind of thing, which of course doesn't happen in front of me. And there are, there are costs and there are benefits to that, right? I mean, I'm constantly making judgment calls about the kinds of evidence that I will hear and the kinds of evidence that the jury will be allowed to hear. And you, if you were sitting there, might come up with different judgment calls. You might say, well, judge, but hold on a second. You just heard that Hannah's cousin Moisha thinks that that guy is guilty. Shouldn't the jury hear about that? Or what about the fact that the defendant has done this three times before? Shouldn't the jury get to hear about that? And I often am, am required to make the judgment call that no, we're not going to let the jury hear that this is a three-time convicted person because they're going to shut their ears off and stop listening to the evidence about this case, and they're going to convict him of this terrorist act just because he's been convicted of three crimes that are totally unrelated in the past, that's not procedural fairness. Now, my ruling may not be substantively fair to you. You may think, well, that doesn't make any sense. We want to know if he's been convicted of other crimes in the past and deciding whether we should convict him now. It's just not the way our system works. Um, so I think those are some of the costs and, and the benefits of our system. Thank you. I don't have any law clerks being paid. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to answer with a story. In fact, I'll answer with two stories. I was once uh, had an occasion to be in Japan. And I was in a remote area, not in any of the big cities, where they hadn't even seen a non-Japanese person there for many, many years. And I was having a discussion there with a, a doctor who was trying to practice his English. So he says, oh, you know, where do you come from? And then different questions about the family. And then he says, are you Christian? So I said, no, I'm Jewish. Now, curiously enough, in Japanese, they don't have the letter J, even though we call it Japan, but they don't have a J. So he's trying to say Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. He didn't know what I was talking about. So he started playing, you know, word recognition, you know, Israel, Jerusalem, matzah, you know. <laughs> it's like, we were not sushi, no. Uh, so, no, I didn't say sushi. So, uh, and he didn't, uh, he didn't get it. And then finally I said Hebrew. He said, oh, Hebrew? Said, oh, very ancient. Very ancient. Because that's something which by them is uh, respect. Um, so I might ha not have uh, law clerks, but, um, you know, when the judge says 1789, you know, that's a long time ago, 1789. But like by us, 
Like, unless you're in four figures when it comes to years. Where like, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is yesterday. In fact, in fact, you, you design, you, basic uh, division, there's a four, um, four level division of authorities. Historically, you have the Tanoim, or the generation of the Mishnah, and then you have the Amaroyim, or the generation of the Talmud. Then you have the Rishenim, the, what are called the early commentaries. And then they have the Achreinim, who are the later commentaries. Okay, that started around 500 years ago, the Achreinim. So that's all like one big uh, category. So, um, you know, I don't have law clerks, but, but I have Maimonides, and I have Rashi, and I have Ravashi, and I have Rabbi Yehuda. I even have Rav Yehuda. And um, I'll just tell the second story. When uh, my uh, my teacher, also I don't know if she's still here, Rabbi Feilshak says, the, the rabbi. Talk about Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we both uh, studied under the same rabbi who was really just uh, two rabbis in Montreal who were just so outstanding. And when I was uh, appointed as judge in the rabbinic court, so I'm taking his place which was, in my eyes, pretty ridiculous. Um, so I told another story, which I think I actually heard from him, that there was a, a rabbi. Communities would appoint rabbis, and you would get sort of a tryout period. And um, in, in Judaism, everybody's really required to learn the same thing. You know, so you're not, you know, whatever the rabbi studies, everybody's free to study. We don't have secret knowledge in, in Judaism as in other religions that only the priests or only the clergy can study, everybody's encouraged. On the contrary, learn more than the rabbi. And there are many places where they at least thought that they knew a lot more than the rabbi. So you had the, all these business people who were actually very, very scholarly. And um, so there was one city, and they just sort of made a hobby out of tearing, out, tearing apart any prospective rabbi that came to be rabbi of their community. So they would devise these incredibly complex questions that needed you know, weeks of research, and then they would just ask him on the spot, and then try to catch him and trip him up, and then if somebody by mistake made it through the test, then they would tear him apart in the subsequent weeks, and they'd have to leave town. So this went on and on, they didn't have a rabbi. So there was once a rabbi that came there, and he was a strong personality, very scholarly, and he passed all the tests fine, he came over there, but they obviously, they wanted to run things their own way, they didn't really want a rabbi anyway. Um, so, but they couldn't catch him with anything, and it went on and on and on. And finally, came a big dispute, a very controversial case in the city, and he offered a, a ruling. He gave his ruling on the matter. And he happened to be a very short man, as was my teacher. Uh, he was very short. And uh, once it was a public uh, event, and they started, um, somebody started mocking him. And say, you know, such a ruling like this, it's such like so monumental and it's so revolutionary, it's such a big ruling. I'm like, you're such a short person. Like, how does a, such a small person come out with, with, with such a big ruling? Like, it's really, it doesn't fit. So it's like publicly mocking the rabbi. You know, it's, the chutzpah is like a... So he, he maintained his calm and he said, it's true. Ich bin a kleiner. I'm, I'm, I'm small. So, but, but, but the bengal was a grace. The chair I sit on is a very big chair. So I'm small, and I don't have any clerks. And in fact, even in rabbinic court, you mentioned kashus. By us, all the judges do everything. So we're responsible for civil cases. We do family law. We do divorce law. We do kosher supervision. We supervised conversions, we do every, all the rabbinic functions that are necessary, and we don't have a lot of staff. Um, uh, and so in that sense, we're very small, but we sit on a very, very big bench. If I may, I just want to tell one quick story that I experienced myself. I was involved in a, in a dintora, not as counsel, but as a director of an organization. And it was, we had a lot of people in the room at every time. Uh, and it was sometimes heated uh, and, and, and um, a typical adversarial procedure. But when Mincha came around, we all got up and davened together. <laughs> and when Marev came up, we all got, got up and davened together. I, and that left a very lasting impression on me. It, it helped keep 
the bonds together. In any event, I think... We don't pray in federal court. <laughs> well, not... not, not there's a constitutional provision against that. People might be doing it privately. Thank you both so much. <laughs> and let me say that if I had a legal dispute, I would be able to sleep at night very peacefully with either of you determining my, my fate. <laughs> Thank you all very much. If you liked that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.